German Air Force, known as the Luftwaffe, a defeat that ended the winning streak that the German military had enjoyed since the war began in September of 39, and a defeat that meant that Britain was safe, albeit perhaps only temporarily, from invasion and conquest by the German army. This event, which lasted several weeks beginning in June of 1940, is known, of course, as the Battle of Britain. I will discuss the what ifs that could have been the result of a British loss in the Battle of Britain, as well as set out more generally the history of the battle in the next presentation a week from today. What I wanna to do today is to review the development of a comprehensive air defense system that allowed the British to win the Battle of Britain. Now I use the word system to mean a multifaceted program with many components all working together here to affect the successful defense of British airspace from attacking bombers and fighter planes. The British system depended on all of its features to succeed. Take away any single major component, either because it's never developed at all or is destroyed during combat, and the system would likely have failed to achieve its goal. But before I want to begin, I, I want to honor this man. I'm just throwing this slide in just today. I, I thought it was appropriate. This is John Hemingway on the right in his time in the RAF and the left, more or less contemporaneous of, of him today. He's an Irishman from Dublin who inevitably was known as Paddy. Group Captain Hemingway is the last surviving RAF fighter pilot from the roughly 3,000 men who served during the Battle of Britain. These men and the tens of thousands of others who supported those flyers made a, in my opinion, huge positive contribution to the history of the world. And I am in awe of him and his colleagues. I will give you one little tidbit about him. During the course of the war, he was shot down four times, survived all four crashes, and is now 101 living in a nursing home in Wicklow near Dublin. So let's start our story by briefly examining the thinking about air power after the end of World War I. For most of that war, the role of airplanes was almost exclusively dedicated to assisting armies in the field, either by performing reconnaissance or attacking enemy troops. Most were single-engined planes, like the Newport 17, depicted here, a French fighter that could do 110 miles an hour, at best, and was introduced in 1916. Now, on the Western Front, Britain, France, and to a very limited extent, Germany, had experienced some bombing raids beyond the front lines. Compared to the impact of bombing in World War II, the loss of life and damage to property caused by aerial bombing in World War I was minimal. A little over a thousand British citizens were killed through aerial bombardment during that war. At the time, those losses were deemed to be horrific, especially since they were of civilians who were not supposed to be attacked by the, an enemy military. German attacks initially came from Zeppelins, dirigibles depicted in the upper left, and then later large uh, bombers called Gotas. The British Air Forces developed their own bombers such as the Handley Page 0 slash 100 shown here. Had the war extended to 1919, those planes and even more modern versions would have been engaged in a major strategic bombing campaign into Germany. Now, as the war proceeded in World War I again, defensive measures improved significantly, leading to significant air losses on both sides. An evaluation of the bombing the efforts of both sides during World War I suggested that the aircraft and aircraft personnel losses suffered did not achieve much of an impact on the opposing side. The British and Germans, for example, combined were able to drop less than 1,000 tons of bombs during the entire war. Nevertheless, during the interwar period, military theorists prophesized that the next war would see fleets of heavy bombers effectively winning the war with massive attacks on civilians, leading to such a death toll 
that it would force surrender without any major ground or naval conflict. Leaders like the Italian general, Giulio Due, and American Billy Mitchell suggested that aircraft should be used in large numbers as an offensive weapon to destroy enemy equipment and morale. Bombers were regarded as the critical part of any air force as they were perceived to be impossible to stop and to carry the means to devastate military and civilians alike. Keep in mind here that at this time, again, we're talking about the 20s and 30s, bombers were typically almost as fast and in some cases even faster than fighter planes. The wisdom of the day was that there was simply no way to stop large massed bomber fleets from wiping out populations and obliterating cities. In 1932, British Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin famously stated that, quote, the bomber would always get through. Thus, the only defense was to build up a bomber force that would kill more of the other side's people than they could kill of yours. So early on, Great Britain put much more emphasis on building offensive bombers than on defensive fighters. Fear of bombing seemed well-placed in light of the reports of casualties inflicted by the German Condor Legion flying in support of the Spanish nationalists during the Spanish Civil War on the Basque town of Guernica in 1937. Almost 1,900 dead and close to 900 wounded, all from just about 40 tons of bombs. Moreover, the contemporaneous press report said that over three quarters of the town's buildings were destroyed. After World War II, careful review determined that the death toll was probably somewhere in the 150 to 300 person. But the impact on public opinion, or perhaps better said, on public fears was forceful. During the 1938 Munich crisis, when it looked like Europe was going to go to war again, something like one third of all Parisians evacuated the city for fear of being bombed. Pablo Picasso's famous painting of the Guernica attack displayed at the 1937 Paris World's Fair doubtlessly added to Parisians' apprehension. And of course, what of Britain? Would London find Christopher Wren's iconic St. Paul's Cathedral, shown here in 1938, destroyed from enemy bombing? Pre-war estimates from British politicians and indeed even senior airmen posited alarming predictions. 20,000 casualties per day, 50 to 100,000 dead Londoners, 20 fatalities for every bomb dropped. Indeed, it was believed that Britain would need 750,000 hospital beds to deal with bombing casualties alone. I should just note in contrast, in the year 2019, the entire United States of America has just under 920,000 hospital beds. But not everyone shared this ap apocalyptic view. In 1936, the RAF created as part of a major reorganization, a new fighter command headed by Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding. He and others in fighter command were not convinced that Prime Minister Baldwin was right in believing that the bomber would always get through, especially if top-notch fighter planes, that is to say planes that could shoot down bombers, particularly before they drop their bombs, are available. Fortunately for Doubting and for Britain, two such planes were on their way. These would be the first building blocks in the complex system that would seek to defend Great Britain from the Luftwaffe in 1940. These new planes are the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire. Both use a new engine built by Rolls-Royce called the PV-12 with over 1,000 horsepower. Now these two aircraft are vastly better than anything else the British have now. Interestingly, private money was being used to build them in prototype form including the engine, soon to be known as the famous Merlin engine. The picture you see here is the Hurricane in 1935, along with the man who designed it, the largely self-taught genius, 
Sydney camp. And in March 1936, we have the very first prototype of the famous supermarine Spitfire, the product of chief designer Reginald Mitchell. Initially, it flew only slightly faster than the Hurricane and was not quite able to fly as high, about 35,000 feet. But the design of the Spitfire was so versatile that the plane could increasingly be improved before and throughout the war to the point where the last model Spitfire was a Mark 24. The one you see here is the Mark I. Note the two-bladed wooden propeller. We're gonna discuss that feature in a bit. Now there are two major differences between the Hurricane and the Spitfire. The Hurricane takes about 35,000 person hours to build, while the Spitfire requires 80,000. So essentially the Hurricane is cheaper to build than the Spitfire is. And the Hurricane can in fact withstand damage better and be more easily repaired than the Spitfire. And one final point I should make that you might think is obvious, all of these planes are equipped with radios. That was not true for some other nation's air force, especially in the 1930s. As you will see, radios were crucial to successful air defense. At the beginning of the Battle of Britain, RAF radio, radios were actually less than ideal. They had only two channels, neither of which was available to communicate with other squadrons. The squadrons would essentially operate on their own. They also suffered from limited range. The Spitfire was based on the 1931 Schneider Trophy winning seaplane, designed, as I said, by Reginald Mitchell, again with private funding. Uh, that funding, by the way, included a gift to Mitchell uh, and the company that was building the seaplane from a woman who gave him 100,000 pounds, which was an enormous amount at the time. The Schneider competition was in fact one of many interwar aircraft contests that led to speedy improvements in airplanes. Now, a limiting factor in decent aircraft performance during this period was the engine. Many promising aircraft designs turned out ultimately to be failures because they had underpowered engines. The Spitfire and Hurricane, and later many other allied aircraft used the British Merlin engine, depicted here. Over the war, it was continuously improved as well, going from 1,000 to 1,600 and finally to 2,600 horsepower. Conclusion, in short, if there's no Merlin, there's no Spitfire, there's no hurricane. Now, one of the more interesting and unusual design features and decisions made in the development of both the Spitfire and the Hurricane was the installation of a grand total of eight machine guns in the plane's wings, four in each. British engineers believed at the time that air combat would be so fast that the longest burst of fire a fighter could make at any one time would be no more than two seconds. Hence, the need to get as much firepower into that brief moment as possible. No other uh, fighters of the era had so many guns. And you should note that of these eight machine guns, two have armor-piercing bullets, two have tracers, tracer uh, rounds, which allow for tracking of the uh, guns fired towards a target, as you would see the bullet as it's moving through the air. And the final four were armed with regular lead bullets. These guns could fire about 1,150 rounds per minute, but the Spitfire and Hurricane carried only 300 rounds per gun. So they were limited to about 15 seconds of total firing time before running out of ammunition. I want to mention two improvements in the two planes' designs that were critical to making this Hurricane and the Spitfire successful opponents of German aircraft. One I mentioned earlier, the propeller. The original planes had wooden fixed pitch propellers. By the beginning of the war, they had metal three-bladed propellers with two pitch settings for the blades of the propeller, one for takeoff and one for in-flight. But these were similar to having a car with only two gears, resulting in too little power for takeoff and too little for most flight maneuvers at flying altitudes. The solution, fortunately for the British implemented just before the Battle of Britain was the constant speed propeller, three-bladed, which would maintain the same number of RPMs for the engine 
while automatically adjusting the pitch of the propeller blades as power was either increased or reduced by the pilot. The results of these new propellers was astounding, astonishing. The Spitfire could now take off in 225 yards instead of 320, could climb to 20,000 feet in less than eight minutes instead of over 11 minutes with the previous propellers, and could fly as high as 39,000 feet instead of just 32,000 feet. And on top of all this, it was more maneuverable. The second improvement for these men, uh, the fellow in the middle is Douglas Bader, and I'll talk about him next week. The second improvement was the use of 100 octane aviation fuel. Most aircraft of that era, including German fighter planes, used 87 octane fuel. But shell company engineers in the US had developed a way to increase the octane rating of aviation fuel. British aviation engineers were able to modify the Merlin engines to use the more energetic 100 octane fuel with impressive improvements. Spitfire now found itself able to fly 25 miles an hour faster at ground level and 34 miles per hour faster at 10,000 feet. German pilots were astonished to find that the same planes they had dealt with easily in 1939 and early 1940 now outperformed them. Even more frustrating for the Germans was the fact that even after Luftwaffe scientists discovered that the 100 octane fuel was actually being used by the RAF, they couldn't employ it themselves because the German fighter's engine was incapable of being modified for its use. Now the principal British, uh, sorry, the principal German fighter during the Battle of Britain, the Messerschmitt BF-109E, sometimes known as the ME-109E, had its own advantages, in particular a fuel-injected engine. If the 109 needed to die while in combat, its engine would continue to receive fuel from the injection process. The British Merlins of 1940 used carburetors, which were gravity fed, which meant the engine would cut out in a dive when gravity could no longer feed fuel to the engine. British pilots learned to turn their aircraft into a half turn, essentially diving upside down to allow the engine to continue to receive fuel in a dive. This took time to execute and put them at something of a disadvantage in combat against the German fighter. And while it only mounted two machine guns compared to the eight on Spitfires and Hurricanes, the 109 had a major advantage over its British counterparts, two 20 millimeter cannon firing explosive shells, cannons firing explosive shells. On this screen, they're right, this is one, and there's another one on the other side. Just one of these going off in a British fighter might be enough to shoot it down. This is the sort of plane the Spitfire and the Hurricane replaced, the Gloucester Gladiator, 70 miles an hour slower than the Hurricane and 100 miles an hour slower than a Spitfire. This is the last biplane fighter built by the British, and it was a good one. It served quite admirably and successfully in Malta, in the Mediterranean, but it clearly wasn't gonna be able to tangle effectively with top-notch German fighters. So the RAF has the plane designs it needs. It's building them as fast as possible. In general, faster than Germany is, as you can see from the numbers for 1940 on this chart. In fact, British fighter plane production during the first four months of 1940 was only half that of the second four months and in all cases was more than double the German output of fighters in that same period. Now, of course, fighter planes, planes generally, are useless hunks of metal by themselves. They need pilots, which is the next piece of the puzzle for Britain's air defense system. The RAF developed pilots from several sources. There might be full-time professionals who would have attended the first Air Force College at Cranwell. The lower right is College Hall at Cranwell. Or pilots might be volunteers in the auxiliary air force, some of whom would be quite wealthy. I'll talk about that next week as well. Intended to be based in a specific location. So for example, the, the auxiliary air force 602 squadron was based in Glasgow. 
or they might be in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve, wearing the badge you see at the lower left. Or they might be students at Oxford or Cambridge or other universities and become a member of the university's air squadron. In the upper right, the badge for the Oxford University Air Squadron. Several different sources. And of course, pilots aren't born. You need training plans. The one at the lower right is the Tiger Moth, a well-known and famous uh, training plane that almost all RAF pilots would first fly when they began their training. So now we have pilots and we have good aircraft. Is that enough? Well, as you can probably guess, nowhere near enough. You also need a whole lot of different people. Mechanics, initially men, but later women, young women. The RAF set up before the war, in addition to the pilot school at Cranwell, a mechanics school at Halton, just west of London, with at least initially a three-year training program that got shortened during the course of the war. That program ended up contributing 20,000 mechanics to the RAF during the course of the war. The picture in the top is the founder of the RAF in 1918, Lord Trenchard, reviewing mechanics students at Halton. Interestingly, the RAF encouraged above average mechanics to transfer to become RAF pilots because they came in many cases from lower social class backgrounds they would become so-called sergeant pilots. Indeed, sergeant pilots ultimately represented about one third of all RAF pilots. And I'm a little sad to report that they were treated quite differently than their officer colleagues. And sometimes it wasn't too bad to be a mechanic on an RAF plane. Out for a little sun, working on a propeller. You'd also need refueling personnel who had to act very quickly in the heat of combat, we get aircraft refueled and back into the air. And of course, you'd need fuel and ammunition depots, and they need to be close by in order to get the necessities that they have delivered to the airfields. You also need armorers. As I mentioned, both these planes had eight machine guns, only 300 bullets good for about 15 seconds of firing. When the plane ran out of ammo, it would have to return to its base and get new ammunition very quickly. And just as, as was the case ultimately in the US, women played important roles ferrying repaired and new aircraft from factories to air bases. Amy Johnson, Australia's answer to Amelia Earhart in the upper left corner, she died while ferrying a plane in 1941. Diana Barnato Walker in the upper right and glamour girl Maureen Dunlop are the other two. Both lived to be over 90, and Walker was the first British woman to break the sound barrier in 1963 at the age of 45. And you need lots of other support. You need leaders like Hugh Dowding, administrative personnel. Somebody has to pay those pilots so they can buy a pint or two after a day's combat. Air Sea Rescue for pilots who end up in the English Channel. And I should add here that German air sea rescue efforts were distinctly better than the RAFs, at least at the beginning. You're going to need airfield repair staff, as those airfields will be torn up by enemy bombs. Fortunately, most of the RAF fighter airfields at this time were grass strips, and therefore somewhat easier to repair. And you also need somebody to pack the pilot's parachute. And you need places to operate, airfields where you can repair, rearm, refuel, and so forth your fighters. You need support buildings at those airfields, hangars, trucks, barracks, fuel depots. The list goes on and on. In addition, because they will be bombed from time to time, you need equipment to make repairs. And of course, the people I mentioned earlier. Communications may be damaged. So people will have to be available to make repairs there as well. Now, there were dedicated landlines connecting the various RAF bases and their headquarters. Those landlines were buried underground and hence were somewhat protected from damage. Interestingly, overall charge of landline communications within Britain was in the hands of the British post office. You need to protect airplanes from air attack if they were on the ground, putting in revetments 
the kind of a somewhat, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, probably octagonal shaped uh, barriers from one airplane to the other. This would mean that if you blew up one airplane in an air attack, it wouldn't cause other aircraft to be blown up because they were so close to the damaged and exploding airplane. The US Army Air Corps didn't have its planes and revetments during the Pearl Harbor attack, which resulted in many aircraft being destroyed, destroyed even though they weren't actually ever hit by Japanese machine guns or bombs. And you need the capacity to recover and hopefully repair damaged aircraft. In all, the RAF has 100 people or more supporting a single pilot. Now, there are other ways of destroying an enemy plane besides using an airplane, any aircraft guns, but they were remarkably ineffective, at least they're on the British side. Tens of thousands of shells being fired for each bomber being destroyed. But as you'll see, they're firing at night. So this is ahead of our story. And indeed, so is this, although these would be helpful, searchlights and their operators to spot enemy planes in the air. But again, this is at night. And you'd also use these simple devices. They're called barrage balloons. They're tied with steel cables to winches, can be lowered and raised over an important target, for example, an aircraft factory, to prevent enemy bombers from undertaking low level, that is to say, more accurate bombing of the target for fear of running into the cables holding the balloons up. And then there is this rather fiendish thing known as the parachute and cable device. This wasn't very effective either, but it's a clever device. Essentially what would happen is if an enemy bomber or plane was operating at low level over a, your airfield, you would shoot this thing up in the air with a rocket. It would deploy a parachute and then deploy a second parachute at the end of the cable. The idea being that the enemy plane would snag the cable in between on its wings. And of course the parachutes, parachutes would cause that's that wing to slow down and hopefully cause the airplane to crash. I am amazed at the cleverness that we humans display in learning how to kill each other. But the truth of the matter is that these devices, the anti-aircraft guns, the barrage balloons, the parachute and cable were only slightly helpful in defense. And we know that. What we need is good fighter planes and pilots. So now we have them and the backup systems to operate those planes. Are we all set? Now, once again, not really even close. The question you need to address next is how do you get those defensive planes to the enemy aircraft flying towards and over Great Britain? Now, the problem with any defense is that the offense, and this is true for ground combat as well as air combat, is that the offense gets to decide where to focus its attention and can go after just a single target with overwhelming strength. Britain had hundreds of potential targets all over England, Scotland, Wales, and even Northern Ireland. The defense has to be able to respond to every possible attack point. And so maybe it's too spread out to be able to deal with a focused massive attack. In addition, the defense has to figure out where its foe is going before it can even respond all while that enemy is getting closer and closer to its target. These problems are what led in part to the belief that the bomber would always get through. Now, while it's not a question that our system can answer, it is critical to know for system design purposes, where are the enemy planes going to come from? Answering that will at least help us set up defenses. So to this map, this is a modern map, uh, but it shows you the key locations, Germany and Great Britain. Now, at the beginning of the war, in order to get to Great Britain, especially the key targets over southern England, for example, London, the Germans would have to fly either over neutral countries like Belgium and the Netherlands, which would be illegal and a cause of uh, them declaring war, or fly a convoluted road over France or over the North Sea. In any case, the attackers would not be able to include protecting fighter planes because those planes don't have the range to fly over and back. They simply don't have enough fuel capacity to fly that far. So you're only going to encounter more vulnerable bombers, right? 
Well, maybe. Uh, and since we're thinking we're going to fight <clears throat> German bombers alone, and they're coming from Germany, uh, well, we need to divide, defend the east side of Britain, right? Well, none of this is really clear to you in 1935, 1936, 1937. What's the worst case scenario our system needs to be able to deal with? Remember, this is supposed to be a comprehensive air defense system, able to deal with a variety of possibilities. Supposing, for example, the enemy turns out to be the French. That is not so improbable. There were events in early 1934 that could have resulted in a fascist government taking over Paris. But we still haven't answered that first question. How do we get those fighters to where the bombers are in order to, uh, in time to prevent them unloading their bombs or at least in time to shoot them down on their way back before they can escape? Now for a minute here, we gotta go back to the first world war moment. In World War I, German bombers were lucky to do 70 miles an hour. If you saw them in the air approaching Eastern Britain, and you did have observers watching the coast, you might have an hour or so to alert your fighters, tell them where the bombers were heading, though it's possible they could change direction, and then have them intercept them before they got to their targets. But now it's 1936 or 1937 or 1938. You're gonna be dealing with bombers that would be three to four times faster. Now you only have 15 to 20 minutes. One thing you could do, of course, is to set up what are called standing patrols, fighters circling over possible targets. But there's so many targets. And if you're trying to defend New York, uh, what are you gonna do if those bombers are in fact attacking Hartford? By now, some of you must be thinking the key word in all this is radar or as the British initially called it, Radio Direction Finding, or RDF. This man, a scientist named Robert Watson Watt, began its development for the British in the mid-1930s. Believe it or not, after investigating for the government and the RAF, whether the Germans had a death ray, a ray that would actually shoot airplanes down. Radar is quite simple. You send out a beam of electronic energy on a certain frequency. It bounces off a hard object somewhere distant from you, and that little tiny bit of energy that bounces off uh, comes back to a receiving screen where you can see it, and it tells you. By the time the Battle of Britain started, radar was able to tell us where the enemy planes were coming from, and possibly a rough idea of how many of them are and in which direction they're flying. This is one of a series of radar stations running all around Britain from Land's End in the southwest to Scotland in the northeast, as well as towards the Irish Sea. Note the lattice work construction. That will be an important characteristic, which I'll talk about next week. Here's a map of the coverages of those stations. You'll see two letters here, CH and CHL, and in some cases, bases, or locations that had both. One of the characteristics of the early radars uh, for uh, the CH uh, uh, radars was that they would only see airplanes at relatively high altitudes. In order to deal with this, uh, Watson Watt and others developed uh, chain home low CHL. Uh, the other radars were called chain home or CH. These chain home low radars were able to detect uh, lower flying planes, but with less distance from the, from the, the coast. So you can see the CH ones would actually extend over France, the Dover, uh, the Calais area, whereas chain home low in most cases would only see uh, out to a fairly short distance from the coast. Now we can certainly expect that these radar stations will be the subject of enemy air attacks to knock them out. What do you do then? Well, one thing you can do is build mobile radar stations like these to cover while repairs are being made to your fixed facilities. They won't be as good, but better than something than nothing. Now, all of these early radar stations could only see forward. They did have the ability to determine generally where any air aircraft were located and give their approximate height and number. And over time, 
in which, in which direction they were flying. So is our system now ready to defend Britain? Planes and radar were all set, right? Well, you can guess no. There's more we need. For one thing, you need to know where your friendly fighters are in order to direct them towards the approaching enemy. And you will need some way to distinguish between your planes and the enemies, which may be nearby, although not necessarily visible either to the defenders in the air or on the ground. The answer for the British was a thing called high frequency direction finding, puff duff, HFDF using a device known, and I'm not kidding here, as pipsqueak. The pipsqueaks were installed as part of the, of the RAF fighter plane's radio, and it would send out a brief periodic beep or squeak from, the, from those fighters in the air. Those beeps would be picked up by special radio stations on the ground, which would then use triangulation to locate where the fighters were. This was a, a sort of primitive form of identification friend or foe system, or IFF, and was replaced after the Battle of Britain uh, when it was over with more advanced and easier to use IFF equipment. But although it was somewhat rudimentary, hip squeak, puff duff, worked to allow fighter command to distinguish between enemy and friendly planes. This was important because you could then inform anti-aircraft guns firing uh, in a particular area not to fire after a certain time when gr a group of, enemy, uh, of friendly aircraft were coming into that, that part of the sky. You wouldn't want to have your plane shot down by your own enemy aircraft. But as you may have guessed from what I was saying before about early radar stations, there's another gaping hole in our system we need to plug. The early version of radar could only see forward the planes that were coming towards them. Once those planes crossed over the coast, crossed over those radar stations, they would disappear from the radar screen. But the British had a system that was initially developed after the First World War called the Observer Corps. This was a group of about 30,000 volunteers, initially all male, using some like, uh, something over a thousand different locations to spot aircraft operating into and over Britain. This is a picture of one of them spotting in London. I think that's St. Paul's in the background. Now the Observer Corps was trained to recognize aircraft types and thus could report in rough terms on the type, numbers, heading, that is to say the direction of flight, and speed of oncoming aircraft. These reports went to a central information center about which more later. British radar could give an approximate, but sometimes erroneous estimate of the number of aircraft approaching. The Observer Corps could not only provide a more accurate count, but depending on the weather and the altitude of the, of the planes, could identify the types of aircraft something radar couldn't do. And of course, the weather would affect how well the men and later women assigned could spot, identify, and track enemy planes. So we have a lot of information coming in from the Observer Corps, the Huff Duff stations, and of course, radar stations. And I do mean lots of information. The same set of incoming bombers could be seen by two or more radar stations and tens of Observer Corps locations. What do we do about these mountains of data? Where does it go and who's responsible for evaluating? How do we make sure that the plane sent to intercept enemy planes heading to location X get only the information they need to deal with their foes at location X. When you may have thousands of sighting reports coming in from multiple locations. At the speeds of modern German bombers, every minute you lose in getting planes to attack them means they're three miles closer to their targets. To answer this critical question, we need to step back for a moment to discuss how RAF Fighter Command was organized. And this map will help. Now, RAF fighter planes are organized into squadrons, 16 planes with four and spares in a squadron. Squadrons are based at an airfield, usually only one to a field. 
Adjacent airfields will be organized into sectors with one airfield acting as sector headquarters. And a number of nearby sectors will be made up into a group. So you have squadrons, sectors, and groups. As you can see here, there are four groups, 10, 11, 12, and 13. This is a map showing you 11 groups. This is the one facing, uh, immediately facing France, and it's the one that would be most heavily tested of all four, given its proximity to Northern France. Each of these groups would have anywhere from four to eight or possibly more sectors within its boundaries. Now, fighter command as a whole would be run by one person who had a boatload of strategic decisions to make all the time. Do we give 85 squadron arrest? after losing so many pilots? Should we add another squadron of Spitfires to protect London from the West? How should we use one group's planes to help another group when a major attack comes in? And on and on and on. In turn, each group had its own head, who had its, his own strategic and tactical decisions to make. Now, as I mentioned a while ago, the overall head of fighter command was Air Chief Marshal Dowding the man you see here. These are the four men who would lead the RAF's four fighter groups. In the upper left is Keith Park, a New Zealander who led Group 11, closest to the Germans. In the upper right is Trafford Lee Mallory, whose fighters in Group, 11, group 12 were located to the bases just north of the Group 11 bases. On the lower left is Quinton, Christopher Quinton Brand, whose Group 10 planes were west of Parks. And rounding out the group in the lower right is Richard Saul, who headed Group 13 in Scotland. Park and Lee Mallory had some major strategy differences, and we'll discuss those next week. These were the men who had to make the tactical decisions on how to respond to German attacks during the course of the Battle of Britain. But we still have the problem of how to use the valuable information this overall system was generated. The genius of the RAF defense system lay in how all of these data were run through a sophisticated and increasingly more effective filtering system, the development of which Dowding oversaw beginning when he became head of fighter command in 1936. This eventually became known as the Dowding system. Now, I want to show you two slides that look pretty much the same, but they're very different. This is how information would be reported in. I'll show you a slide in a minute showing you how orders were made and, and issued. As you can see here, Fighter Command would receive reports directly from radar installations. Information on um, observer corps locations would come in. I'll give, use my arrow here. Here are the radar stations reporting into the field to the filter room. This is the fighter uh, uh, command's headquarters. There would be uh, Royal Observer Corps centers and Royal Observer Corps posts, all reporting information in to the filter room. Now, remember, there's a thousand of such Observer Corps stations. So you needed a place like this to kind of organize the Observer Corps information before sending it into the filter room. This information from the Observer Corps would be summarized and then forwarded on to Fighter Command Headquarters. Now, Fighter Command Headquarters had a filtering and plotting room that looked like this. In this room, plotters would, tr would create a track for each oncoming German attack using the onrushing information from Observer Corps Headquarters and the radar station. Senior staff would try to determine if the raid was real or a feint, one that was just intended to draw off RAF fighters away from the real raid, perhaps coming in a bit later. If those senior staff determined that the raid was real, they would then provide the incoming data to the RAF group involved, but only to that group. In short, Fighter Command Headquarters would filter the information so that the group involved would get only that portion of the masses of information it needed to respond. So each of these groups 
had their own operations rules with a map that would cover only its area of concern. Group 11 would have the map, would have a map similar to the one I showed you a moment ago, just for group 11 area. The incoming information from fighter command headquarters would be used to plot the tracks of enemy raids in that group's area. This is what those rooms look like. I'll show you several pictures here. Now, each of these women is, are using croupier sticks to move wooden blocks around a map tracking table. Those little things you see they're moving are wooden blocks. Those blocks would have summarized information about a group of aircraft, hostile or friendly. You'll note they're all using earphones through which they receive the information from fighter command headquarters without disturbing the other plotters or the senior staff watching from the tables above on the mezzanine. Now this is a picture of 11 groups filtering room. It's now a museum, but it's set up as it would have been during the battle. That's a mannequin uh, of one of the uh, Women's Auxiliary Air Force or WAAF women moving the, uh, the uh, various um, wooden blocks around. There are a lot of things in this picture and I'll get to them in a moment because you need to know, know about them. First, let's talk about the wooden blocks. Now there's a block, there's several of them here. Uh, the block here, H04. This is a hostile group identified as the fourth one. You can see next to it is another one, it's identified as number six, and still another one identified as number 10. It's been estimated to be 30 or more aircraft. That's the, the red letters below. If a raid has been intercepted by RAF fighters, then the blocks are changed with information on the height and number of the enemy force and the numbers of the intercepting RAF squadrons. So for example, we have this block, center left, 21 planes operating at about 15,000 feet, which has been attacked by two squadrons, 229 and 303. Incidentally, by the way, uh, 303 is a Polish uh, piloted squadron, one of two fighting in the RAF during the Battle of Britain. I'll talk about them next week as well. Now you need to track your friendly aircraft using the Huff-Duff system. Here's how it was done. Here you have a, a friendly force, the F for friendly, and another one. This one has five, I'm sorry, six planes, and this one has 12. And they're going to attack a hostile force uh, at, I believe this would be 30,000 feet with roughly uh, 30 or more enemy planes. Now, I want you to note on this particular picture, the colored arrows in the lower right corner here. You'll note that some of them are yellow and some of them are blue. The blue is a little hard to see, but take my word for it, they are blue. They show the tracks of oncoming uh, enemy forces, again, with quantities. And the arrows are placed one after the other as uh, new information is coming in through fighter command into the group headquarters. I want you to notice the colors because the, the ones that are placed earlier are yellow, whereas the four uh, that are closest to the block are in blue. There's a reason for this. And the reason is reflected in this clock. This is an amazing part of the system. The arrows on the map plotting table correspond to the colors on this map. Yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue, red. Each one is a five minute segment. They would show, the arrows would show the senior controllers when any particular arrow was placed on the plotting table. When the WAAF women would put an arrow down, they would look at the clock, see which color the minute hand was on, and then use that same colored arrow. If the clock advanced such that a particular color reappeared, so for example, if you had uh, this clock is about to go into the blue sector, the blue from, from uh, 20 minutes to 15 minutes to the hour. All previously placed blue arrows would be removed. That way, uh, it would be old information would be, would be removed and the newer information only would remain on the board. This system gave the group commander watching the map, map uh, tracking table only fresh information to see, and he would know how fresh it was. This is a good example of this clock because it's about to go into the blue sector. 
And as soon as that happens, those WAFs will start using blue arrows only. And if there was uh, a yellow arrow that had been placed here, it would be removed. Now the group controller, the man who had to decide how to deal with an oncoming German flight, thus had a system that gave him at a glance all of the available information about that raid. It then became his responsibility to deal with it, to decide which RAF squadrons to send to attack that raid. Of course, he needed to have precise knowledge of the fighters available to meet the oncoming Germans. This meant having information about the status of the fighters, the RAF fighters, within his group. This information was tracked using what was known as a tote board. The tote board is in the background of this particular picture right here. Little better picture here. You will note the sectors, the names of the sectors. Again, this is 11 group. All of these names are of sectors. And above, uh, below them are the numbered squadrons that are based within that sector. Excuse me. Remember I said that there were more than one squadron per sector. Kenley, for example, has four squadrons. This tote board tells him exactly what's going on with each of those squadrons. Here's a picture that'll show you that. So for example, it would tell you which of the 14 different classes of readiness that squadron is in. It could be released, which meant it wasn't available at all for whatever reason, maybe transferred for arrest somewhere. Two various levels of availability, ranging from two minutes to take off to 20 minutes to take off, or status of planes that were already in the air, such as being ready to move at the controller's direction, um, or having enemy aircraft in sight, or perhaps ordered to land. These same time colors that we talked about, red, yellow, and blue, would be used to tell the um, controller just how long the squadron had been in a given status. Even more useful information was available to the group controller. This picture is of the tote board, but below the colored lights we just saw. It shows you weather information about airfields, visibility, how far could you see, height of cloud cover, miles or meters perhaps, or yards, uh, the visibility, uh, how high the barrage balloons might be in important areas, such as Dover. For example, in this picture, the, the Dover barrage balloons here are at 4,500 feet. In between, and this is a little harder to see, but uh, in between the tote board columns above and the weather and barrage balloon information below was data called state of squadrons. You can see the words right there. That gives for each one of the squadrons above how many pilots it has. And this, this first squadron has 19. And how many aircraft it has, 12. I can assure you that during the course of the Battle of Britain, those numbers decline. But at this point, this imaginary point in the battle, that's what you had. And here was the hot seat. This is where the group controller sat. He overlooked the entire setup below, the plotting table, the tote board, the weather, the status of aircraft at his disposal. All this information was one thing. He would have to use his judgment, experience, to decide what the information all meant and how to respond to it. Next week, we will see how well they, they did it. Notice how many, air, how many telephones he's got. This photo uh, is again of the uh, museum version of the uh, 11 group uh, uh, plotting table, but it gives you an idea of how the uh, group commander and his associates could work up here, glassed in, away from the hubbub, and the noises associated with the plotting team. This is a real-time picture of a group headquarters in operation during a German attack. Note the headphones again, which allowed the WAAF women to move plots without a great deal of noise to disturb other plotters or the officers on the group headquarters mezzanine. But it would have certainly been impossible to avoid some noise during the work, which could certainly be chaotic. Here is another real-time depiction of a plotting table in a group headquarters. There are a lot of women working here. Finally, sector stations themselves have their own plotting tables. 
again scaled for just their sector. As group specific information flowed from fire command headquarters to the groups, sector specific info information went to the sector stations as well, giving them a chance to prepare for the orders that would shortly come from the group controller. So here's how the decision making would take place. This is a similar uh, diagram, but it shows you uh, how decisions would be made. Note in particular that the tactical decisions about which squadron or squadrons to detail through a German raid was not made by the fighter command headquarters. Dowding knew he was too far away from the immediate situation, and there were simply too many tactical decisions uh, um, to be made in a given day for the job to rest on one person alone. Moreover, once RAF planes were scrambled to meet a raid, managing those planes in the air was sufficiently complicated that group controllers couldn't do it. That job was given to sector controllers. They would instruct the responding squadrons on the course to fly to intercept the raid, how high they should climb to give them the very useful altitude advantage over the enemy. To assure that their information would be taken seriously by the pilots in the air, sector controllers, here depicted with the acronym GCI, Ground Control Interception, were almost always pilots themselves, either older or perhaps on convalescence. A couple of details worth noting. Observer Corps could provide relevant Observer Corps sighting information directly to sector stations, sector operating rooms. Second, sector stations would advise anti-aircraft batteries in their area of oncoming German aircraft as well as the approach of friendly aircraft. So they could fire and then stop firing when the RAF fighters approached. And third, group controllers managed the uh, barrage balloons over important targets. You might wonder how these sector controllers would enable his fighters to get at the enemy. This was a serious problem early in the development of the doubting system in the 1930s. The courtesy of an intelligent RAF uh, commander and a wizard scientist named Sir Henry Tizard, a simple solution was developed. Through the filtered information from group headquarters, the sector controllers knew roughly the heading or direction the enemy planes were flying. They had a rough idea of the plane's airspeed. Through the Huff Duff system, they knew where their fighters were. It became a relatively simple exercise using the principle of equal angles to send or vector those responding fighters along a given path to intercept the incoming foe. If you ever played hockey or, or hunted with a gun, you know you have to lead the enemy or lead your, uh, your guy getting your hockey pants. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. Now to make this whole doubting system thing work, the RAF had to practice and practice and practice. The RAF did literally thousands of simulated interceptions before the Battle of Britain to iron out the weak points and make sure everybody knew what they were doing. We'll figure out whether it worked next week. But take any piece of this out and it doesn't work at all. No radar, no filtering room, no modern aircraft. I'm getting close to the end here. We need a few more things, not quite as important, but still useful to make this comprehensive system work. You need code words to communicate with pilots in a speedy and consistent fashion. Scramble, take off, for example. Tally ho, you see the enemy. Angels, how high you are, and so forth. We need code words for squadrons and their controllers. Hello, sword leader, this is Foxtrot, do you read? And since we have planes that will occasionally be operating over the English Channel, we need to be able to rescue them if they end up parachuting into the drink. And there are other ways to get information, slower but useful. Listen to enemy, enemy radios, broadcasting information. You need obviously people who can speak German. You can also pretend to broadcast orders, which uh, will be false in German to oncoming German planes. You need to debrief your uh, pilots after a mission, see what happened, and what improvements they can, they can recommend from their experience in the air. You need to down enemy examine downed enemy airplanes to determine their weaknesses, maybe even repairing them and then flying them to discover their weaknesses and their strengths. You need people to interrogate, captured German pilots and crew, like the guys in this picture. 
And sadly, you need medical personnel to help wounded pilots and ground crews recover. Some of them will have to be plastic surgeons to deal with horrific facial burns and injuries. One more thing you might wanna do is, we'll give information about your operations to the press to, to boost civilian morale. This particular headline or we'll talk about later next week. You need to make technical improvements, have scientific uh, experts continually seeking and making improvements to your planes, your radios, fuel, guns, and so forth. As we mentioned, the Spitfire went from the Mark I in 1936 to the Mark 24 at the end of the war, 350 miles an hour to 450 miles an hour in the space of only a few years. So let me give you a quick explanation of how this would all work. This is an example of an imaginary one, but it could have been real of how this would work. I want you to track this as you're looking. Uh, look at the numbers with the, uh, the planes. This is a German raid of 20 Junkers 88 bombers taking off and forming up to fly in formation over France. They turned across the English Channel. Looks like their target is London. That's number one. Number two, at this point, before they even leave France, the radar stations along the English coast are detecting their approach. In number three, which is where, in, oh, over here, in, up to the left here, uh, the RDF operator determines the range and bearing of the enemy raid and estimates the number of aircraft and its altitude. Via telephone, they report this information to the filter room in, in, uh, at headquarters. That's number four in the upper left. There, plotters receive the incoming RDF radar grade information and put it on the large filter room map table. The first plots from the rating JU-88s appear on the table. Within two minutes, the filterer there has determined the major course of the raid and placed a raid plaque on the map table. The filter room teller those are the, some of the women in that room, passes the raid information on to the operations room at Fighter Command. At the same time, they pass the information on to groups and sectors in the defense system. This is number five. Because this raid is crossing into Southern England, group one takes action. Plotters in group 11 operations room receive the raid information and plot the raids on their map table. The group 11 controller watches the raid develop on the map table and assesses the possible targets. He makes a decision on how best to use the forces under his command to intercept the raid. In number six, the same place, he orders the squadrons, certain squadrons, to intercept the raid. Group contacts the appropriate sector command by a telephone. In number seven, the group controller from group 11 now orders squadrons to intercept the raid. Because the plotters have been plotting that raid on their map table, having the same information that group headquarters had, they're prepared when the order comes to scramble squadrons. The sector controller orders the airfields to scramble the intercepting squadrons. At the airfields, the squadron's pilots run from their dispersal bus, sorry, their dispersal huts to their aircraft. They take off in groups, attempting to gain as much altitude as possible. Every minute wasted is 2,000 feet of altitude lost. Four minutes have passed since the radar station detected the raid. Almost 20 minutes, number eight now, have passed since the JU-88 raid was first detected. The first interception occurs a few miles from the English coast at spot number eight. After the initial wave of fighters breaks off to refuel and rearm, the raiders continue on to their target. As they cross the coast, they are no longer visible to the radar stations. Now the Royal Observer Corps must track the raiders' progress as they cross the English countryside. That's nine up to number 12. Now the Observer Corps handles responsibility for tracking the raids' course and altitude. Observer staff posts have been established all throughout the countryside. As the enemy craft cross overhead, the observers use simple tools to determine its altitude and its direction. The observers convert this information to a reference using a grid system the British have developed. They communicate that information to their respective Observer Corps headquarters. From the headquarters, liaison personnel pass the information on to the relevant sector headquarters, as well as to group headquarters. That's number 10. 
Greg, may I, may I pause for one moment? Sorry? May I ask you to pause for one moment? We had a question here in the chat. Okay. So Annette asks, in the Splendid and the Vile book about the same period, the author mentions parachute mines and also a two-beam system that Germans use to guide their aircraft. Are these things you described, but in different words? No, those are what the Germans used. What I'm talking about is what the British used. The, the system that you're talking about is called Nickbein. It was used by the, the Germans initially uh, uh, more for bombing at night when you couldn't see targets. And eventually the British were able to defeat it by uh, using uh, essentially radio signals that, that uh, obfuscated the uh, radar radio beams coming from Germany to guide the German planes. But that's a little ahead of our story here. All, we, all you're seeing here are British radar stations, British observer corps, all tracking the incoming German raids and responding to it by providing the information using the system, the doubting system that I've been describing. Now, as you can see, number, number uh, uh, 12, we have still more fighters from other uh, uh, airfields attacking that, that raid. This is how it would work in theory. The question is, would it work in reality? All of these elements are in place and there's been a lot of energy and money and time setting it up, but did it work? For the answer to that question, you've got to come back next week and I'll tell the rest of the story. Questions, I went 10 minutes too long, I apologize. I'm Any gonna questions? go ahead and mute people. And if you would like to unmute your microphone to ask a question, please go ahead and do that. How, how long a, uh, the, the attacking bombers would be strung out over how many miles if there were say 60 bombers? That's a good question. They tended to fly pretty close together, probably not that far, 60 bombers, I would, I would have to guess, I would say less than a mile. Oh, really? So there's a lot of activity in that mile then with all these fighter planes attacking this kind of bunch of uh, bomber, bomber crew. That's right. But remember now that for uh, certainly the uh, locations, and you'll hear this next week, the locations nearest uh, uh, to France, Group 11's and London itself, which is part of the Group 11 uh, responsibility, you also had German fighter planes, which were used to protect those bombers from the RAF fighters. The, the, the interesting thing, for, uh, I think, that, that uh, makes the doubting system rather remarkable is that it was set up with the expectation that German planes that were attacking Britain would come from Germany and they'd be too far away to have escorting fighters. They had to deal with those fighters because now those fighters were based in, along with the bombers in 50, 5 zero, new air bases all scattered across Northern France. Those fighters, the German fighters, now had enough range to accompany those bombers to uh, bomb locations. Could I ask a question? Go ahead. Was there, an air, uh, was there a, a system of suppressing a civil radio to prevent it from interfering with these problems? I don't know. Uh, my guess is that they, civilian radios probably were, were frequencies that would not interfere mm -hmm. with the RAF's radios. I would hope okay. so. I mean, okay. otherwise you'd be shutting down the entire radio system for the entire nation. That would be uh, scary for the British public and maybe technically impossible because you wouldn't be able to get to everybody in enough time. So I think the answer is probably that wasn't a problem. Was there also a system for capturing these uh, pot German pilots who survived to prevent them from coming back? Well, yes. Uh, and again, we're, we're, that's, you're anticipating something for next week. These are German planes flying uh, over Britain. If their plane is shot down and they parachute out or they crash land, uh, they would certainly be um, uh, surviving. They would, and they'd be rounded up. Now that system, I actually have not looked at that. That's an interesting question. My sense is that that was somewhat haphazard. Uh, 
but you'd have probably have observer corps, I'm guessing you're now, observer corps saying that there was a German plane going down in flames over you know, Romney or something and heading in this direction. And there'd be an RAF uh, uh, people dedicated to rounding these people up. But the first people who would get there would be frequently, would not be a military personnel, they'd be farmers with pickaxes. Mrs. Minerberg. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the, I, I just, just as a little tidbit for what it's worth, that was not always uh, the safest place to be. Uh, I, at this point in the war, I don't think the, the British would, uh, you know, stiff upper lip British and all uh, would have done anything. But during the uh, bombing campaign uh, over Germany in 1943, 44, and 45, if you bailed out of, a, of an Allied bomber, and landed on the ground near uh, the, the public, uh, and not near to uh, you know uh, Luftwaffe or the German army guys who would be able to round you up. You were in some danger, and there were lots of examples of, of, of Allied fighters being of, of pilots and crew being killed by angry civilians. Thank you. So we have another question in the chat here from Nathaniel. He asks, "Were the ground-to-air guns effective?" No. No, again, I, 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 it'd be worth talking about the, the blitz. The, the, the blitz, as I'm sure many of you know, occurred uh, once the Battle of Britain was over. Right? When I say over, that nobody really had a clear indication on either side that it was indeed over. Uh, German tactics changed, uh, and it was, sort of became obvious over time that well, they weren't attacking the same way. Uh, and Eventually, what happened, of course, was that the German bombers, instead of flying during the day when they were capable uh, or uh, at risk of being shot down by, by RAF fighters, they started flying at night. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there was a, a lot of uh, anti-aircraft guns all around London. And I remember one data point, which I'm going to give you from next week. They fired in one month, I think in September, something like 260,000 rounds of, of uh, shells at the German bombers. And in the course of that entire month, shot down seven of them. Do the math. That was a lot more damage done to, to Britain from these shells uh, coming down after they've exploded into shrapnel, hitting a house or maybe even wounding somebody than in fact was done to the German uh, night bombers. But it was important for morale that they, they be fired, those guns be fired, even if they, weren't hitting anything. Of course, nobody said to the British public, we're missing all the time. It was the sense of, we're shooting back. They're getting what, what's for themselves. That, that made people feel at least like it was, it was, it was okay to get bombed because they were, they were of the opinion that the Germans were getting it as well, even though they really weren't. All of that is you know, 1940. Uh, subsequently, there were all kinds of efforts made to improve the ability of night fighters on both sides, I should add. Uh, to deal with night bombing. But no, it was terrible at first. It's a complete waste of, not complete waste of, of ammunition, but close to it in terms of actual impact on the enemy. I have a question. Go. Oh. Did the British give consideration to setting up a secondary line of chain home in the western part of England that could have picked up contact after the attackers passed the first line? Apparently not. They didn't do it. It might have been resources. I was just curious. Well, that it would have been. You know, I mean, would have devoted, required lots of resources and and people and so forth. So, but to the best of my knowledge, no, they, they didn't consider it and they didn't do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, what was the um, what did the Navy do uh, during this uh, during the Battle of Britain? Were they involved in? Uh, spotting planes and that kind of thing? No, uh, generally no. Uh, about the only real use the Navy had at this point. Well, let me back up. Remember that the, the purpose, and I haven't really probably talked enough about this, the purpose of the German attack was to eliminate the Royal Air Force, to keep it, just to wipe it off the, the table as a, uh, a, an available, re, available resource for the British. Why? Well, they were planning on invading. At least they said they were going to invade the British Isles. They didn't really have any, and I'm going to talk about this too, they didn't really have the right kind of equipment or the plans. The, the 
uh, German Navy was terrified of the prospect because all they had were these incredibly slow barges that were not really uh, all that good in the, in the water. Rough water would make them take water and sink. It was gonna be a, a disaster if they were going to be attacked by aircraft. And they were also terrified of the Royal Navy, which at this point in the war, after the battles in, particularly in, in uh, Norway, uh, was much, much more effective and much stronger than the German Navy, which had been decimated uh, in the fighting in, uh, in Norway. So what was gonna happen, the fear would be that uh, if they didn't get out the, the RAF, then the, the, the Germans would be attacked not only by in the air, but also from the Royal Navy. But the Navy, the Royal Navy needed to preserve itself because it just couldn't afford to you know, put out picket destroyers to, to identify incoming airplanes because what would happen, they get sunk by German planes. The Stukas were great at dive bombing. Uh, the, the German uh, plane known as a Stuka was a dive bomber. So they basically um, laid low uh, up in, you know, uh, Scotland and Northern England, ready to pounce if the invasion should actually take place. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you for the, the one hand, ma'am. Uh, okay. Uh, two, two. So, okay, two, very good. Uh, uh, Robin, are you still there? I'm still here. Uh, I think we, we should probably call it for now. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's attention. This is a fascinating story. Uh, I've enjoyed immensely putting it together. Next week, I'll tell you the story of what happened and also a few personal opinions as to uh, what would have happened had the battle not turned out the way it did, um, which is almost, almost too terrifying to even think of, but whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will I'll bid you all good night and we'll talk in a week. Good night. Thank good you night. so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank Robin, you. I'll call Peace. you. I'll call you next week, 15 minutes early again. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Have a good night. Good night.